Hey, folks, Rick Hackey, the war champion, is back in the building. And today, I wanted to uh, put the joystick down for a moment and have a good old discussion with you. Yeah, so today, that's kind of, that's the intention. It's more of an opinionated sort of perspective base. This is just, you know, get me sharing my, you know, my wisdom and knowledge from with you after playing for so many years of Kingdom Rush, you know. It, it, this video is going to like basically discuss like why I think certain why why Kingdom Rush might be hard and how you can approach beating it comfortably. You know, and you know this is just discuss the things to look out for and, and things to observe, like certain things that you can reference in this game. I want to share that with you so that you can help help when it, help assist you when you're setting up your strategies or when you're approaching. Um, certain stages, how you can go about handling um, certain stages uh, based on what I may not go too in depth on certain in certain aspects, but based on what I when I made the videos like on, you know, my top five, like hardest campaign, heroic and iron stages uh, for the most most of most part, most people agree that, you know, quite a few of the elite stages or the post game stages gave people quite a bit of trouble compared to the, you know, the main campaign stages. Uh, you know, from from Southport to Dark Tower. So, uh, but nonetheless, I still factor that in in this whole conversation. But that I'll um, I'll talk about that later on in the video. But I just really wanted to make this little video so it can be informed. So, without further ado, let's commence and and understand what we're going to go through, folks. Yeah, so the first thing, yeah, so this is just the ways to help you in your approach. I, I just broke it down in four, you know, generalized um topics here. So the first thing um, I feel that's important before even playing the game is to understand the purpose of the upgrades and how they make specific towers and spells more robust and basically more effective. You know, I think if you if you really take the time to ponder and understand the the, the upgrades in, you know, why they are the way they are with respect to, to each of the towers and spells, that can help you and help you like gain a, a pretty that that at least gives you some kind of background knowledge as to as to how that tower is going to work and function in the game you know you know what it's going to be strongly suited for the second the second one we'll talk about is the understanding the reflection that the advanced towers have with respect to the upgrades in this game i feel like the producers in all the games honestly the producers have a way of telling you sending you a message and when, and when we're done, I'm going to share with you that message that I think that they're trying to tell you and, and how that advanced towers, you know, how they reflect the upgrades. And then number three and four, that's more of like a that's more of like a tower defense one on one approach. It's not really the first two points are more geared towards Kingdom Rush. These are those three and four are more towards like one on one tower defense. That's just understanding the nature of the paths that enemies take and identifying hot spots. We'll go over that. And then lastly is the recognizing the danger of the wave composition. You know, when when, um, you know, when enemies appear, you know, what 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 is it that they're bringing like specifically and how do you you when you want to defend against it you know what type of towers you should look to set up in order to to thwart the strategy that the producers are trying to bring to trouble you so let's so that's kind of like the four um things that i have um set up for this to help you in your ways in approaching you know beating kingdom rush but without further ado let's talk about the first thing which is the upgrades i want to talk about that talk about these upgrades we need to get i feel like if you get a good understanding of them you can you can ultimately come to a whole you know come to an actual theme with respect to each of the upgrades and then know how they you know like i said how they what they're strongly suited for in the game so like like so obviously when you progress uh, throughout the game the difficulty obviously gets harder. So for instance like when you get to level four like level four upgrades like are necessary especially when you get to ice wind pass. But how do you know um, when you get to a certain stage when you know what certain upgrades are going to be vital at that particular point? You look the best way to do that is to look at the heroic and irons irons challenges. That's what kind of I feel like that will give you a clue because if you get to like let's say um, yeah, Icewind Pass is a good example. That's when you finally that's when level four upgrades are are demon. The, the producers have said that they're saying that level four upgrades are essential for you to beat the heroic and iron stages. So if that's the case, you should try and think that the level four upgrades should be vital for you to be able to beat the campaign stages 
comfortably. You follow me? So like you just look at the can the heroic and iron challenges and kind of give you a clue as to as to what kind of upgrades you should be having at that point. So uh yeah, so as you see, I just kind of set up the you know level one upgrades. That's vital for Southport. You honestly don't even need upgrades for Southport to tell you the truth, but it, it does help to have that, you know, level one, level two for the outskirts moving to Twin Rivers, level three, Silver Oak Forest to Cold Step Mines, Ice Wind Pass to the Waste for level four, and then Forsaken Valley to the rest of the game, level five upgrades are necessary. So let's look at the upgrades. Let's see what they're what they are specifically. So I'm, I'm not going to go too in depth on them. I'm just going to explain them. You know, the, the salvage upgrade, you know, selling the tower um, for archers. So I, I feel like that upgrade is kind of more like, you know, meant to it's meant to last. It's meant to be like something when you play Kingdom Rush and let's say you the archer towers might not be might not work in certain situations. You can always remember like when you're maybe an approach when beating Kingdom Rush or beating a stage, you can set up a lot of archer towers, maybe to deal with a lot of enemies that you feel archer towers are going to be necessary to get to kill off to kill off using that. And then no, it may be in a, a tight situation where archers might not be the most useful you sell the tower so but you get a lot of your money back you get 90 percent of your gold back for every other non-archer tower you get 60 percent of your gold back so when you so th i feel like that that they made that as a first upgrade it's kind of interesting that they did that but it i feel like that's an upgrade that goes a long way with archer towers so whenever you play certain stages you're doing some difficult challenge you could probably keep that in the back of your mind with respect to archers that you know if you set up a lot of them you're for sure going to get 90 percent of the gold back and the gold that you're getting back that's after the first after you start that's when you initially start the wave so after wave one moving forward that's when you get all your gold you get 90 percent of your gold back but before it, the wave starts you you get all your gold back if you sold the towers um, the next one is the marksman's mar the eagle eye. That's when they increase the range. So they feel the producers are basically saying that they want the range to be um, greater, especially um, early on in the game for level two upgrades. You know, with respect to a level two upgrade, the range matters. You know, with respect to the archers, then level three, you have the piercing shot, which ignores ten percent of the physical armor. So at this point, this is telling me that so far level two was to increase the range. Level three is more of enhancing the damage, specifically against armored enemies. So now, like if you have an orc that's 30% armor, the, if the archer touches it, it's now basically hitting an enemy that has 20% armor, basically, because it's ignoring 10% of the armor. So that that right there, the, the second one was more of the range. The third upgrade is more for damage. The fourth upgrade again is range, and then finally the last upgrade is that the producers are saying um, marksmen have attacks have a chance of dealing double damage. So there's a ten percent chance of that happening. So basically, from with this whole archer tower in the game, they're basically saying that they improve the range. The, the range is guaranteed improved, but there's the archers already whatever the damage the archer is going to do the the damage they're not affecting the damage the dps of the archer they're just giving it a chance to potentially do higher double damage and then there's a chance of it and then also it can um, bypass an enemy's armor so really the nature of the archer tower is meant to be able to hit enemies from further out and also be able to uh, it's also be able to, you know, do possibly double, do possibly more damage. But the, th the key thing is specifically with that level five upgrade, the key thing is damage. It's a potential for the archer tower to do double damage. That's what the producers are saying as a level five upgrade. They, they're saying that that precision of it possibly doing double damage is, is deemably worthy to be classified as a level five upgrade that they are going to find that they think is essential for you to be able to beat um, the stage Forsaken Valley all the way to the last elite stage, which is Castle Blackburn. They're saying that they find that essential for you to beat those stages comfortably with that upgrade. So the damage, so the DPS is not affected in these upgrades. It's just that the final, it's just that overall, what you can deduce is that range and damage matter specifically with the archers. That's one thing you can take away from that. And then moving right along is the barracks tower.
So earlier in the game, you see they have the toughness training where the barracks are trained with more health and the armor. They um, and The second upgrade is to improve the armor. So that's just basically already what you can deduce from that is that toughness training and better armor uh, that's just to make the barracks more durable early on. That's what you'd expect anyway in, in, in any tower defense game. If you have a barracks, you'd, you'd expect their durability to be improved. The third one, you finally get the rally point range um, enhanced by 20%, and the soldiers' training time is reduced. So that basically in, improves their deployment. The fourth one is the barracks are trained soldiers with even more health. So their health is increased. So that's overall these four... The first four upgrades, the importance of it is just to enhance their durability. I mean, that's pretty much what you can get from that, um, specifically with the barracks when you're playing. And then lastly, the level five upgrade, the one that the producers find deemably worthy to classify as a level five upgrade that they think is essential for you to beat uh, level five um, upgrade stages comfortably is they have what is called spiked armor. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, basically, anytime a soldier that's attacked, they return 10% of the damage to the attacker. And that, that this applies to the reinforcement and the hero. Now, I do have a question on this one. I'm a little confused as to which, when they say it, it returns the damage back to the attacker, I don't know what, that da what damage they're talking about. Like, if they're talking about the damage that the attacker was was going to do or if it's based upon the it's a 10 percent of the damage that the attacker was going to do or if it's 10 percent of the reduced damage like for instance if if a service was attacking gerald and let's say gerald was level 10 you know gerald has 80 percent armor and the service did 80 was going to do 80 is it 10 percent of 80 that the service is going to get um, back as true damage or if it's going to be 10% of the reduced damage so if Gerald was attacked by the service and it did 80 um, Gerald being level 10 he would only get a damage of 16 so that would 10% of 16 would be 1.6 but the game would probably round that up to, to 2 so the service would get 2 um, true damage back in return so that that one's kind of it's kind of um, up in the air I don't really know which which damage they're talking about but the point is as you can see durability matters with the barracks and then lastly um, what you can deduce on that last one is basically high is basically damage the, 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 the damage is what matters in um, specifically with the barracks for level five upgrades. So that so there you see already a trend right now. Archer damage was um, a key thing for level five upgrade. Damage is a key thing for level five upgrade for the barrack, specifically for this last one with that spiked armor. And then next, the mage tower. The mage tower in the beginning, they increase the range by 10%. The second one, the mage is able to destroy a piece of the armor. So again, that means if you were to exploit getting a lot of mages going and you knew that presence, maybe that you you're on a say maybe the citadel, for instance, um, where there's a bunch of marauders and uh, dark knights and brigands appearing, you can exploit the uh, having a lot of mages to, to reduce a lot of the armor that they have, thus making them weaker, so that they're more. I'm, I'm sorry, not necessarily weaker. Well, that true, weaker, but more vulnerable. So that's the point of having that. That they have that there as the level two upgrade. Level three upgrade is the mage tower's construction and upgrading costs are reduced. So at that point in the game, the the producers want the mages to be. Uh, more easily accessible because their their price has been dropped, right? So you, that that's the point when the mage is no longer cost a hundred; they cost ninety for level one, and so on. Level two and level three, and then their upgrades too. And then level four, finally, they enhance the attack damage. So interestingly, in the beginning of the game, the mages damage if, if they increase, they didn't want the they in the game they didn't want the mages damage to be increased. Um, you, you know, earlier in the game, like we, we, let's say level one as a level one upgrade, instead the range mattered more than the damage. I feel like if they did that, that would have made the game a lot easier back, um, especially early on when you played. But they, they interestingly level four, it's a level four upgrade. They finally say, hey, when you get to Icewind Pass, when you get to the um, Stormcloud Temple in the Waste, the damage really, the increase in the damage finally matters. They increase by about 15%. And then lastly, interestingly, the level five upgrade, they, they, um, magic attacks slow the enemies by 
half their speed. And if you have an arcane wizard, because of the nature of it attacks, it can slow an enemy down for a full second. And it can also disable the rocket rider's boost. So that's interesting. Finally, you're seeing as a level 5 upgrade that damage is not the big is not the big we it's slowing down units it's slowing down units i know i'm i know i'm emphasize i'm 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 talking primarily about the level 5 upgrades but i'm doing that because again like i said before most people found elite stages you know the most troublesome so i'm trying to trying to i'm i'm going somewhere with that so slowing down enemies matters it matters drastically to the producers. They said with when a mage tower, the slowing down the enemy matters as a level five upgrade. That's that's they find that essential for you to be any stage where level five upgrades are necessary. They find that essential for you to beat the stage comfortably. All right. So that's with the mage. And then with the artillery. In the beginning of the game, they increase artillery damage. So earlier in the game, artillery's damage is a big deal. In earlier in the game, as a level one upgrade, then its range is increased. Artillery construction and upgrading costs are reduced by ten percent. So like like the same thing, just like that mage tower as a level three, at, at level three upgrade, the same thing with the mage and the um, artillery. Their construction and their upgrade costs are are reduced they're reduced so that means that so it's just it's the same thing that means they just want it to be more you know some shall i say more easily accessible you know the fact that it's it costs less now to to buy the um the artillery tower and then level four the uh, the abilities are now reduced by 25 percent. so that's with respect to the tesla <coughs> excuse me sorry and then the uh, big bertha their up their upgrades are finally i'm sorry their special abilities are reduced by a by twenty five percent, and then lastly, here you see smart targeting, which makes artillery ridiculously stronger. They suffer no splash damage or ch and chain lightning damage. So the artillery, um, it says the artillery strikes mat, um, deal the maximum damage at the center of the explosion. Uh, at the edges of the explosion, the further away the center, it deals minimum damage with this upgrade. So upgrade, they deal maximum damage no matter how far away they are from the from the innermost part of the radius of the of the attack. So the Tesla is able to do max damage. The chain lightning is able to do max damage and the Big Bertha can do all artillery can do max damage at, no matter how far away the enemy was from the explosion. As long as it got touched and same thing, it applies to the shrapnel. That uh, the only thing I think I have a question on that one. I don't know if that applies to the Big Bertha's um, Dragon Launch. I don't know if the Dragon Launch exactly does max damage. It's actually a pretty good question. I don't know if the. I also don't really. I I'm assuming that the that those um those little pieces when you get that pieces upgrade with the Big Bertha, I think that does max damage every single for every single um pieces pieces um, when they when they hit the ground i think that's true but don't quote me on that but i i think that that's true but as you can see here level five upgrade that basically is telling me that higher damage when you see the the transition from like you know the the damage that was the damage specifically with the artillery the fact that it was able uh, beforehand with the previous upgrades, splash damage was um, reduced. Now, splash there's no reduction in the splash damage. So that's a huge spike in the power that the artillery is able to do. So it doesn't matter how far away enemies are, it's guaranteed to do max damage as long as they get touched. That's a big deal. So there, that right there is telling me high damage, level 5 upgrade, high damage matters with, with that. Moving right along... The, the rain of fire. So this one's kind of like it's kind of like common sense because the rain of fire is meant to be able to do um, is meant to do uh, massive. It, it, you, you should expect it to do more damage as you progress um, to the to the to the higher um, upgrades. So as you can see, but the main thing to see specifically from the transition from the level four tier upgrade to the level five tier upgrade is that. The, the damage is increased. <coughs> Excuse me. The damage is increased with res 
there's a um when they jump from level four to level five the damage is increased and also the rain of fire touches all over the it could touch in random parts of the battlefield so that's telling you that and by the way the rain of fire this rain of fire in this game is the most powerful of all the rain of fires compared to kingdom rush um frontiers the rain of fire in kingdom rush is the most powerful if i'm not mistaken so they're telling you that um rain of fire touching touching in multiple parts of the battlefield it matters that they, they want that to hit in all parts of the battlefield and they want it to do more damage. so as you can see high damage is a big deal specifically with the um <coughs> oh my goodness i'm so sorry folks I'm so sorry, but high damage is a big deal. You see there's a transition from there, and the Reign of Fire is the most powerful in this game, in the, in all of the Kingdom Rush games anyway, compared to Frontiers. So that's that there, and then in moving on to the reinforcements, you see durability is enhanced as you go uh, further down the tier upgrades, and then as you get to level 5 upgrade, the Legionnaires now have a Spear Attack, but notice that the... That the um, the spear attack. Notice the attack. the 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 range damage is is the highest of all range damages in um in the Kingdom Rush series. By the way, they do twenty four to forty compared to Kingdom Rush Frontiers. The the um the reinforcements only do sixteen to thirty when they throw their spears. So that's telling you. And by the way, one interesting thing to under to to take note of is that why do you guys think that the reinforcements when they throw their spears, that cost the most stars. There's a reason for that. The, the, that that cost them out of all the stars to upgrade. That cost the most stars. In fact, if you were to try and you know, if you wanted to you know get through the earlier part of the game, most people, especially some players that are more experienced, if they wanted to get through the earlier stages, most people would go for upgrading only reinforcements and try and get that level four upgrade. I mean that level five upgrade with respect to the spirit though, because it's so they're, they're, they become very versatile and dynamic. You can place the reinforcers anywhere on the battlefield. You can, as you already know, but they have the ability of just doing massive range damage. So the fact that it costs four, it costs four stars. There's a reason for that. But you know, the, you know, maybe you can ponder on it and question why do you think the producers made it to where of all the upgrades in this game, that one costs the most. Um, that one costs the most stars to have upgraded in the game, and maybe because of the fact that there's so much that you can do with a reinforcement. You know, you in fact you can you can pretty much beat the game with every stage without a hero with. Just um, but just using the reinforcements, you can beat the stages without the hero having that. So that, that maybe that's their way of trying to tell you that, hey, reinforcements have like maybe the biggest out of all the upgrades. They have one of the biggest impacts in the game. But the key thing to take away here is the transition from level four to level five upgrade. There's a basically that's telling me that there's a transition where there's an increase in damage. The, the reinforcements now have the spear throw, so they're able to do four times their melee attack. So they're they're now di more dynamic. They have melee combat. Now they have a ranged attack where they do high damage. And to note, importantly, the damage that the spears do is greater is the greatest in all of the Kingdom Rush games. So with that being said, the stages what. Why to answer the question why I think why what makes Kingdom Rush hard to answer that question what matters most in this game is high damage. When you see the upgrades, the high damage, you notice that there's a five to one ratio with respect to the level five upgrades. Their high damage is a big deal, and then slowing down units is also a big deal. So that combo of being able to Delay the advancement of an enemy and be able to do high damage to them matters as far matters greatly in this game And that's what I feel like in my opinion makes the game kind of challenging is that you have to figure out a way to do High a lot of massive damage to the enemies the towers should be effective enough 
You should be well equipped enough to be able to do that. But in this game, that's where it really matters. And then on top of that, in general, there's more elite stages. Or basically, there's more stages where level five upgrades are necessary to beat the stages because you have you have once you get to Forsaken Valley, which is the eleventh stage in the game. That's where level five upgrades are are ne they, The producers are said that that's necessary to have at that point. So now you see that's that's the ratio there. In case you might not have figured, you might not have thought about that, but I pondered on it. and I realized that 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 combination matters. So when you might be setting up your towers, you could always keep that in the back of your mind that slowing down and doing high damage to enemies that combo is good but not necessarily just doing high damage the high damage there's a certain way to do high damage to certain enemies there's a, there's a certain ways to go about doing that and the other way to go about doing that is when you look at the towers i'm sorry yeah moving on to number two which is the towers so the towers in this game in my opinion, I feel like the towers are meant to do. They're 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 very well equipped for high damage. Like they really they're they're a good reflection of what the producers made, especially at the level five upgrade. Like the ranger, it's special specifically with their special abilities. The ranger is everything it does is high damage. Like if you compared it to the rank the crossbow fort and kingdom rush frontiers. Frontiers, they have the, the crossbow has that bullet seed attack, which is meant for high damage, but it only has one specific ability that's geared towards high damage. The Ranger has two. It has the Wrath of Forest, which is also not only that, it stops the enemies dead in their place, but they also has the poison damage, which makes makes sure that every every unit gets a touch of poison. It, um, as long as that unit is um is 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 not immune to poison. So that that the ranger already it already follows towards the path of doing high damage and it's in its own unique way the musketeer is meant for high damage it's meant to potentially insta kill and if it doesn't insta kill it's going to do high damage with that with that um sniper shot but then also the other thing about the musketeer that it has is it has the the shrapnel shot where it has that artillery shot so that's meant to do high what area damage the tower is meant for high area damage if you compare that to the let's say the uh what's that tribal axe throw which is more of a support type tower th there's a difference there there's a difference there but uh, but my point is, is that that tower is meant for high damage the paladin tower which is something else if you compare it to the the um what is it? The the Knights Templar. This tower is also meant primarily for stalling enemies, but it's also meant for doing high area damage because they have that fill my wrath attack. Compare that to the um, Knights Templar and Kingdom Hearts Frontiers. It's they don't have that. They have something else where it's specifically a one on one type of special ability where they have the. They, they, they cut the enemies and force them. To, they, they can cause major bleeding. But the paladins are meant for high area damage. The barbarians are meant to be ferocious. They're meant to be able to do high damage when you make the upgrades. They're also meant to attack flying units, thus making them more, ver more um, dynamic, just like the reinforcements. But they also possess what? An area attack to do high area damage. Ranger can park enemies in the garage and park a total of eight. So that's that's stopping hordes of enemies by doing damage to hordes of enemies and also make sure they if they if you have the poison upgrade, they touch them up with the poison. The, sh the shrapnel from the musketeer can decimate hordes of enemies. Paladins have potential of doing high area damage. The barbarians have potential of doing high area damage. And then we move on to the arcane, which is unique because it doesn't really follow suit with doing high area high area damage. The nature of how it attacks, it's the tower that's the most powerful. Every single attack it does potentially 88 to 161 when you have the level four upgrade um, upgraded again high damage 88 to 161 i think that is the highest damage of all the towers in even compared to frontiers and even in kingdom rush origins yeah 88 to 161 that's high high damage in this game sorcerer 
may not be high damage, but the fact that it's able, it's it's very dynamic. It does forty nine to ninety, and also has a lingering effect of doing dealing what true damage. So it's forty nine to ninety plus a lingering true damage attack on the enemy. Plus, you also have a what a earth elemental that you can summon that is is very powerful. It does. 50 to 70 when maxed out compared to like in frontiers the death rider does um, 15 to 25 when maxed out but the point is is that you have an earth elemental that can do what high area damage so in case you just realize that in kingdom rush compared to frontiers the paladins the barbarians and the earth elemental they all are capable of doing high area damage in in frontiers it's the opposite the units the knights the assassins and the uh the death rider are just meant for one-on-one -on -one combat so there's a difference there big bertha very equipped for doing high area damage it, in fact it does 55 to 110 110 being the max but it also has three it's very versatile it has three um, you know, as a tri combination attack, as I say, it has that dragon launch and then it has the Reese's Pieces bombs where they hits the ground. I, I, again, like I said, I think I'm, I'm sure it should be able the the no splash damage applies to those those cluster bomb attacks. But I, I just I'm not 100 percent sure, but I, I, I'm, I'm I'm sure that it does. But again, high area damage where the, the attack because of that no splash damage is guaranteed to do 110 in a specific area and then the tesla as you already know already is meant for high area damage so the overall thing among the towers how they reflect how they are a reflection of of the um of the uh the upgrades is that specifically all of them all of the towers, with the exception of that arcane wizard, but the arcane wizard effectively slows down units. It, it slows down units the most, but it also does the highest. Damage. They all, it's a big deal in this game, specifically with the towers. They all have something in common. They all are capable of doing high damage, high area damage. In this game, that's a big deal. And then slowing down the units also, again, is a big deal because that's, it's, it's deemably, the producers have said that that slow curse is deemably worthy to be classified as a level five upgrade. So that's so if you ask me a good way to counter the enemies in especially the elite stages, because that's where it that's where a lot of people say they have the most trouble in is you getting a tower combination that's that's really effective in being able to do high damage and high area damage because as you saw area damage is a big deal with specifically with respect to those level four tier towers and then also being able to figure out a way to slow down the units you know so to me that's what i kind of feel makes kingdom rush a challenge and if you if you I mean, if you test the waters, maybe maybe you can see where I'm coming from. But that's what I feel, in my opinion, that's a big deal. High damage, high area damage and slowing down the units, not slowing down, not so much compared to to doing high damage. But but it is still a factor. It's a big, big deal. Yeah. So then also moving right along. Uh, this is more of a one on one type of thing, understanding the nature of paths that enemies may take and identifying hot spots so that can affect your perception on how to defend the threat of the advancing enemies. Like, so, for instance, let's say you're playing the sage dark tower, right? You know that there's two entrances, right? And then you have a graveyard. They all convert you, but there's one exit. So, you know, at some point, they all got to converge to a single point in the battlefield. So if you're playing Dark Tower, a good idea is to set up a tower that's very appropriate for dealing with area, dealing with enemies that are all going to bundle up in one particular area. So most people will probably go with a Tesla. You could also get away with a shrapnel, but a Tesla would be a very good decision, be, uh, specifically right there next to that red um, circle. The, the strategic point, the Tesla there is perfect because the enemies. Um, it's on a bend, so the enemies stay within range of the Tesla, and the nature of the Tesla attacks, it does an area, a 360 area attack. So, if you're playing the game, that's something to keep in mind. Just being able to identify the, you know, the the nature of the paths, you know, where the convergent points are at, and um, knowing where, 
you know, knowing, figuring out what tower is going to work best in certain parts of the map. Also, another good example here, Hockroach Plateau. Um, here you see in this one, in my opinion, I call them jackknife. There's a lot of jackknifing. That's basically what I mean by that is there's a lot of cutting in between the paths. So there's three hot spots, in my opinion. It's right there. Um, where I say very hot, it's two very hot spots and then hot. So what I mean by very hot is that that's where um, it's more threatening there because the, I'm, because obviously you see where at the top right, that's where the enemies, um, the non-troll, specifically the troll pathfinders, they don't, the troll pathfinders obviously take that path where the ice that you see that little ice path at the top, that's where they are, that's where they're gonna come down at, right? And then you also have the enemies coming from the right top right entrance. So they're gonna crisscross at that point because maybe a pathfinder might bust loose. So that's a hot spot for you probably setting up a tower. Maybe a Tesla, maybe a Ranger, maybe a shrapnel shot from the garrison might be um, efficient. Or there's another hot spot right here in front of this other strategic, right in front of that same strategic point. There's That's where there's two of the paths um, co-joined together. That's a very hot spot. And then here at the bottom right, it's a hot spot, but not as hot as the others because the troll pathfinder it's with respect to the troll pathfinder. They they may not get there at this bottom part of that. Uh, they may not get there at just that single hot spot right there. They might not get there if you do your part right of cutting off, you know, of, of killing the, the, the pathfinders. And then on the iron stage, they bring gargoyles flying from where the pathfinders at too. But if you kill the units off in that area there or at the one the other very hot spot there, that's where that's where you you would um you would um you would you would just basically analyze and say those spots are really hot and that's where I need to make sure I I don't let enemies get past these particular choke points these particular hot spots if you if you understand what I mean so that so that right there is one way that's kind of like a one on one type of thing where you just understand how you just understand, you know, the nature of the path and then just identify where the choke points are at and then, you know, plan strategically to deal to deal with that. Obviously, a good uh, a good tower to set up right there will be a Tesla because the Tesla you got. This is an interesting stage where trickiness with the paths is a big deal. Where So this Tesla could hit enemies in all um, different range and all a 360 degree range. So pathfinders behind it and trolls brethren troll brethren and wolves and and such in front of it so that's that's another example there i could go on with some other examples but i just want to show those two examples so that's just that's one aspect there and then the other approach is recognizing the danger of the wave composition and that often is kind of like a um, a reflection you know it kind of builds with wisdom you know your experience as you play specific stages um, like, for instance, let's see, you, you, you see the wave composition, right? You see that there's a magic and armor enemy appearing together. You also, um, you might set it, you might have to prepare by setting up a combination of mage and art, uh, mage and physical damaging towers, or maybe an artillery tower and have a barrack to destroy both, both, um, enemy types. Maybe that, maybe that might be more efficient. Also, for instance, recognizing hard to kill enemies appearing in the midst of hordes of enemies, ranged enemies along with me melee units, ground level enemies appearing along with flying enemies, time lapse in between the waves sometimes, like for instance on the heroic stage on, um, what is that, Night Fang Swell. The, the third wave, the eight, they bring eight black hack, 36 wards. They start the wave very fast. So you have very limited time to deal with the enemies that might be left around on the battlefield. So they'll they'll start the wave pretty quickly. Recognizing that, though, 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 I mean, there's so much more, but just in general, recognizing the danger of the wave composition. I feel like that's a very important thing to to. Um, to factor in. So here's some examples here, like you play um pit of fire right you know you're on the 15th wave you know on the right hand side they bring a combination of magic and armor resistant enemy they're bringing four demon legion eight demon lord along with a Cerberus. so you know that you need a tower to um you need towers that are going to be well equipped for it and as you can see here um in this example um uh, 
I do so. I have a mage tower, the sorcerer, along with a barbarian tower, and then I have the earth elemental there. So it's a complement of physical damaging units along with a mage tower to deal with the threat of the magic and armor resistant enemies appearing. The next is also the uh, other example of this is on um, what is this? Uh, Glacial Heights. So this is the 11th wave coming up. They bring a total of 48 wolf, three troll breakers. So on the right side, you see they bring only 16 wolf, one troll breaker. And then on the top left, they bring uh, they bring 32 wolf, two troll breakers. They also do it on the heroic stage too. the third wave. They bring 38 war, one troll breaker, 18, 18 winter wolf. So they bring the house with hordes of enemies to be in the and, and they also bring a powerful hard to kill enemy in the midst of of all these um, these weaker enemies, you know, so you, sometimes you just have to figure out what tower that you need or what how you're going to be able to deal with um, getting rid of these hordes of weak enemies so that you can focus on getting rid of that problematic enemy. That's another thing to keep in mind when playing the game, um, you know, setting up your strategy, how to approach dealing with that. Other thing, they, have, they bring a range unit. This is the fifth wave of Sargas's Lair Heroic. They brought 10 Warg on the right, 6 Dark Slayer, 15 Shadow Archer, 30 Dark Knight. So they got a range enemy in the picture. You know it's that annoying Shadow Archer that can drive you crazy. So how do you deal with that? Maybe you want to, um, maybe you might have to grab the Shadow Archer's attention by using reinforcements so you can focus on getting rid of the Dark Knights and Dark Slayers. Or you, you might have an, a, another way, maybe you exploit the hero, you have playing with a hero, you might want to grab their attention so you can have other towers focus on the Dark Knights. There's so many different ways you could go about it, but that's just one example of, of, of um, you know, just recognizing that and then coming up with an, uh, an efficient way to deal with stopping the threat of the other, of the enemies. And then here is another example. You got a, this is the fifth wave of the heroic stage for Hawkwatch Plateau, where they brought a total of 15 Pathfinders, 25 Gargoyle top and bottom. So you got flying units potentially hovering over these um, ground level Pathfinders, so they can they can uh, they can um, mess up the aim of targeting the the Gargoyles because the Pathfinders are perceived closer to the to the exit. But as you can see there, there's a Tesla right there at that hot spot. Where, where I feel in playing this stage in general, if you a, a Tesla there is one of the wisest things you can set up because of the fact that it hits in all all directions, so enemies will get hit in every you know in every direction. So the the gargoyles, however, might not be the main target. It, it might not be the main target because of the fact of the pathfinders changing the aim of of the tower. So if you happen to have a non-Tesla tower there, the 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 gargoyles might go unscathed. So you might want to have to rethink your strategy. Maybe set up a like I did here a Tesla or so, and such. So th those are just these are all just little things that I wanted to put together. But overall, th I mean that concludes this video. But overall, um, that was the that was the main thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was specifically the upgrades in Kingdom Rush. I feel like I said. High damage is a very big deal in this game. And, you know, you know, I mean, I know that sounds like it's common sense. But if you look at the upgrades and understanding the upgrades that can t you can eventually map out an overall thing they, that they're, the producers have tried are trying to tell you that damage is a big deal. And slowing down units is a big deal, too, as that with respect to that level five upgrade. And then also just the other part was just in general, that's more of a one-on-one -on -one strategic um, approach on how to play, how to play any tower defense game in general. So that was all folks. That's pretty much the, um, the video that I kind of want to, I just want to put that together just so we can discuss, you know, what to look for and how to approach beating the game. And um, if you have any, any questions or any comments, feel free to be in the comment section and, um, Chop it up, folks. Share with me your opinions that you that you feel you, you need to share. So thank you, folks, for watching. Uh, stay tuned for more vids that will come your way. Ricky Eke, the War Champion, farewell.